I'm back. So, for JSP of the students, I'm back after four years without teaching. So I'm eager to teach till midnight if you allow me. To. So uh, now, one of the major drivers uh, that everyone talked during these days, which is global climate change. But again, the obvious things of global climate change are not that worries me. What worries me is not those things that are not so obvious. And this is what I'm, I will try to show you. Maybe I can convince you. Well, those figures you have seen everywhere, in newspapers everywhere, and this is where I live. Well, not exactly under the, the, the wave, but this is where my institute is located, right by the sea. So it's we're worried about the equipment there. But then uh, I'm talking about the, the less obvious impacts of climate change. Yeah? For instance, if you talk about, uh, as we discussed it here, about the difference in the coastal zone characteristic, if you have areas where we call hungry, sediment hungry areas, areas that naturally has a very small supply of sediments. So the impact of sea level rise is erosion everywhere. If you have opportunity to travel to northeast Brazil, what you're going to see is erosion everywhere. And not only erosion that you can see the beach going down. Now you see schools going down, streets going down, hotels going down, and all urban infrastructure. Because it's a natural coast of low, very low sediment supply because it's semi-average. Other coast that has cliffs, for instance. And remember, those coastal sediments have been accumulated to some distances for years, for thousands of years. So if you erode them, you're not only eroding sediments, but you're eroding everything that is in there. Uh, I'll show the results of a very recent paper that hasn't been published yet in Poland, in a bay in Poland, that erosion due to sea level rise is now the most important source of mercury to the bay. And the bay is Gdansky, full of shipyards and industry and everything. And erosion of these cliffs are producing a huge amount of mercury, about 10 kilograms per year. It's the hell of a lot of mercury. <coughs> On the other hand, the coastal plain areas mostly in the tropics in the, and the subtropics, where whenever sea level rises increase, saline intrusion increases. And mangrove has been adoring saline intrusion for 70 million years. So they immediately grow. Since all the glycophytes will be killed by the salinity, they will move inland. And in certain areas, it can be a nuisance. In New Zealand, for instance, there was a large juridical problem of, of cutting mangroves because it just grow over the beaches and, and the guy that has a beautiful house in the beach, there's no more beach, there's only mangroves. Mangroves can, can thrive very well in this area. But again, remember that we're not talking about only mangrove. Mangrove is not only plants. Mangrove is a different metabolism. And so all the biochemistry of the area will be changed if mangroves grow there. Bioavailability of pollutants are highly dependent on biogeochemistry. If global climate change indirectly changes the biogeochemistry, it will change the biogeochemistry of elements, of pollutants. And even myself, I'm still talking about the future. If global change alters the biogeochemistry, it will contaminate people. Even myself, which is, I'll show you, often a study showing that the people are already being uh, highly exposed to pollutants because of that. We still think about global change as something in the future. <coughs> so part of the metal load that's being accumulated in this area, not only metals, because PCB also accumulates and is not degradable. Even in anoxic mangrove sediments, GGT, which is normally uh, quite uh, uh, easily Oxidized the environment is not oxidized in, in, in mangrove sediments. We measure GGT compounds in mangrove sediments in Sepetiba Bay, where it was forbidden to use over 40 years ago. But it is still there. They are protected by these anoxic sediments. 
Well, this is the example uh, from, from Poland, from Gdansk Bay. The increasing of over 50% of mercury inputs due to erosion of cliffs. And cliffs are sediments, carbonatic sediments, that does not accumulate as much mercury or metals as uh, the typical mangrove clay sediments. But you can see the amount of increasing, and most of all, again, most of this increase is in lab bioforms, because you are changing the biogeochemistry, you are changing the stability of these chemical compounds. Therefore, they are more bioavailable. So it's not only increasing concentration, but increasing the bioavailable concentration. Yeah? Same thing in mangroves. This is in the northeast. This is erosion due to sea level rise, eroding. Again, this is the typical profile, the highest concentration of metals are below the surface because they have been accumulated because of sulfate reduction, and then you erode that, and worst, in fact, of you diluting it in the continental shelf, since the ocean force in this area is even stronger, these things is moved into the estuary, where they again suffer a new process of remobilization and changing. Well, I noted, I already showed that. Uh, this is what I told you about the, the very small number of rivers that could be used. But basically, you see increasing heat and therefore decreasing uh, rainfall in these areas. This is the example of the, the semi arid coast of Brazil. You see that the decreasing in rainfall is quite clear. It's amazing. I mean, uh, obviously, it, maybe this is a, a, a law of maybe of God because uh, the, the people will, will suffer is all the ones that are already suffering. So the poor people will be more affected by climate change than the rich people. And the semi-arid climate is much more affected by losing more water than areas that has more water. So you see, and this is a very important thing, because this is the rainfall during the dry season. That's the rainfall, the average year rainfall. You have a drop of about five millimeters per year of rainfall in Northeast Brazil. Five millimeters. Ugh. No one, you don't know even what is five millimeters of rain. I mean, maybe it's not, not even 12 years old whiskey served in 20 millimeter flask, because it's too small. But if you think about that, in this area, you have 400 milliliters per year. Then five meter loss per year results in the last 30 years in over 35 degrees in rainfall. In fact, Northeast Brazil is, is witnessing a, a drop of about uh, six years now. And this has a major impact. But not only the average year rainfall, but during the dry season. I mean, you have eight, year, eight months in the year without rain. But we depend on very small rainfall during the dry season that keeps the vegetation alive. And then the drop is much larger than you have in the average. So again, in the dry season where we have less water, you're going to have much less water. So the problem is aggravated because of that. And apart from that, you have the problems of the dumbing of the rivers. <coughs> Well, then, uh, then it's a kind of uh, a, a quite paradoxical thing. If you think about the, the papers from, from there, clearly showing an increase in continental runoff in higher latitudes and a decrease in continental runoff in lower latitudes. Yeah? And then you're probably aware about that, so plenty of literature showing increasing of contaminant inputs to the Arctic Ocean, for instance. It's increasing at a very fast rate. And, and, uh, and uh, animals and fish and mammals are, are reflecting that. And this is a typical impact of climate change by increasing the continental runoff, taking contaminants from the permafrost, from the uh, terrestrial ice and whatever. So we expect that at least this global change impact in the semi-arid coast of northeast Brazil and other areas like Senegal, uh, Australia and other dry areas in the world would be good because we're going to decrease the transport of pollution to the ocean. And then we start working with this aspect and we saw 
increasing concentration of mercury in the continental shelf of CRI stage of the major rivers. And well, you know, those are the rivers that I showed in the, this area. Is this river here, where the continental runoff dropped 200 cubic meter per second to less than 20. So we were expecting a decrease in the contamination of the adjacent coastal shelf. But then what you see is much higher, even higher concentrations of this river than in the most urbanized area in the state. So it's a, a quite paradoxical. In fact, the title of the paper is the Arctic Paradox because we expect a decreasing of concentration and we imagine increasing concentration. So what's happening in this area? Was meaning that it's not easy just say, well, you are decreasing the loads, so you are decreasing the impact. We are increasing the load, you are increasing the impact. But it just doesn't happen like that, unfortunately. And, and, and this is quite unfortunate for decision makers. This is the hydrological balance of one of these major rivers in the semi-arid area. This is the same thing in, in semi-arid Australia, semi-arid Africa, Brazil, Mexico, everywhere. <coughs> During the, the dry season, if you look at the amount of water that stays in the estuary, you see, you make the balance. I'm not going to, to take too much time on this. Well, I'll show some graphs later. But anyhow, this is the amount of water that is kept in the estuary from what is coming in from the river. And this is a very important thing. Coming from the river is about 200 cubic meters. But you accumulate 400 cubic meters because there's a mix of seawater coming in and blocking all the fresh water flow. So during the dry season, you have a, a coastal lagoon in the estuary. I mean, everything is blocked by seawater and a small continental contribution that cannot break this barrier of tidal water. So graphically, what happens in terms of hydrology? You, during the, the wet season, you have a typical estuary. I showed earlier those uh, geochemical traces of these water masses, meaning that you have a high flux. The flux passes through the estuary and deposits and spread as a plume in the continental shelf. During the dry season, you have a very small flow that cannot break the tidal blocking. Therefore, it inundates the estuarine area and stays there for a much longer time. And I think I have this time somewhere here. This is an estimation of the residence time of the continental water in the estuary during the dry season, during the wet season. So you see, you have orders of magnitude in residence time difference between the two. So during the wet season, the water passes through the estuary. Time of reaction, very small. Most of the mercury is being carried and all metals carried associated with suspended matter that flows and deposits in the continental shelf under oxic conditions. During the dry season, the small flux that brings the continental runoff cannot break, break the, the tidal waters, inundates and accumulates in the estuary and stays there for days. In fact, we measure already 13 days of residence time of the continental water in the estuary, reacting under high temperature, high biological productivity, beautiful place for producing any kind of chemical species. So those are the, what happens under this scenario. Basically, uh, the transfer of material will depend on the magnitude of the flu fluvial flux and the continental runoff, the residence time of the waters in the flooded area, the sea level variation that affects, may affect, uh, the tidal uh, prism. And, and the blocking of the fresh water. So how global warming affects these variables? And this is, uh, remember the first slide? Now we move into the ocean forcing. The first thing is we showed about what is happening in the continent, on the basins, damming, agriculture, and whatever. Now we go to the ocean. What's happening in the ocean? The Atlantic Ocean is accumulating a huge amount of heat. Maybe some people already talked about that. It's not my speciality. 
but it's the ocean that is accumulating more heat among all oceans. And part of the this heat came from the Agulhas leaking between Africa and the continental circumpolar current, the Antarctica circumpolar current, and cross the ocean. And there's animation as a, from a colleague on Gusby, Edmo, that we worked together for many years. And then you can have a very clear picture of what happened with the Indian Ocean, extremely hot. This is not heat accumulation, but temperature. Yeah, heat accumulation, the, the Atlantic is more. But temperature very high, flowing through the Agulhas leaking, crossing the Atlantic in vortex to reach in Brazil. Part of it reach exactly the Jacuaribe River. So this is what eventually occurs in the continental shelf and uh, deep, uh, closer deep areas in this, in the dry and wet season. In the inner shelf, during the wet season, you can have even a plume of fresh water forming. I show one slide showing that. But even during the wet season, you can see the coastal water being contaminated by the Atlantic central water. And during the, even in the inner shelf, <coughs> during the dry season, all the inner shelf is basically coastal water with a small contribution of the Atlantic, central Atlantic water. If you go to the middle and the outer shelf, then you can see the effect of these edges of the ocean water coming into the the continental shelf. I mean, it enters into the continental shelf from the deep ocean and push the continental shelf waters into the continent. And this pushes destroying masses inside the continent. So this is the destroying mixing area of typical marine to coastal waters. No, it's not fresh water, just coastal waters and ocean waters. During the dry season, at the surface, it occurs at the end of the plume. <coughs> in the middle water, it migrates close to the coast and a little bit more in bottom waters. This is a very shallow continental shelf. There's not many difference. When you go now <coughs> in the dry season, then you can see easily the migration of the coastal water inside the estuary. And this is a combined effect of the ocean forcing and the low continental runoff. So all the, the ocean migrates into the estuary, blocking all the fluxes, like I said before, and increasing the residence time. Then what it causes on, on the chemistry of pollutants. You gave time, you gave uh, productivity, you gave biota to provoke changes in chemical speciation. And this is what's happening and explain why this paradox between higher and lower latitudes. This, as I said, is uh, uh, the evolution of mangrove cover in northeastern Brazil. 57% of the, the increase in mangrove co cover in southeast Brazil occurred in the areas that never had mangroves before. Because obviously, when you have some engineering work, if anyone has go to, go to Fortaleza, there's a huge urban mangrove, over 700 hectares, which is man-made, because that was the old uh, salt ponds that people dredged and, and provided hydrological patterns and planted mangroves, and now it's a nice, nice urban park of mangroves. Very nice if you ever go to Fortaleza, go there, there are areas to walk. Obviously, it's a mangrove, so sometimes it smells sulfide as any healthy mangrove, but it's a very nice place to go. But most of the increase in mangrove area occurred in an area that has never had a mangrove, because in fact, there are river banks covered by freshwater plants. But with saline intrusion, freshwater plants are being substitute, substituted by mangroves. Like here, this increase in 0.7 to 1.4, doubling of the area of mangroves in this Pacuchi River. And in a way, you can say that engineering works, dams are probably due to a direct anthropogenic impact. 
But areas that has never had mangroves, no, it's a global phenomenon. It doesn't depend on that. And it's a very fast phenomenon. This is mangrove from one year to the other. You see the colonization of new banks, the various generations of mangroves occur in this area. The amount of islands and the area of river islands, there's a sediment being blocked in the estuary and very happily colonized by mangroves. Yeah? In a total, we have a 21% increase in mangrove area because of this process. Stronger oceanic forcing, decreasing continental forcing. And obviously, following that, we have our beautiful pyrides full of trace metals forming at a very fast rate. But as I said, <coughs> sulfate reduction is, an, is not a very good way of consuming organic matter. Meaning if, if we use sulfate reduction to feed ourselves, we we'll need to eat maybe 10 or 12 kilos of meat to, to be fed. Because uh, while we have a production of about 700 uh, joules of energy from one mole of organic matter through oxygen oxidation, you produce less than 64 when you do oxidation using oxygen from uh, uh, sulfate. So a lot of organic matter is not degraded and is released in the form of dissolved organic compounds. And dissolved organic compounds has this unfortunate capacity of complexing metals, keeping them in solution, and increasing their bioavailability. And this is what happened. I mean, the mangroves still accumulate a lot of, of the metals here. In this curve here, you see the flux between low and, and high tides of total mercury and bioavailable mercury. And uh, obviously, total mercury coming with particles accumulate in the mangroves, so it's, its concentration is much higher in the water coming into the mangrove than in the water going out of the mangrove. But it, when you take only the bioavailable fraction, then it's the opposite. It came, enters the mangrove very small because it came from the continent associated with particle, but then reacting with high residence time are released by the mangroves under very reactive forms. Here is the distribution of organic carbon and, and the species, different species of mercury in the pore water of mangroves where all this uh, picture is occurring, mediated by sulfate production. You have a large production of uh, dissolved organic carbon, that complex metals. So you see this red thing? Here is the, the, the culprit. Here is the, the bad guy. This is very toxic. It increases at the surface and is released into the surface water and it's released to the estuary. When you compare this process in the dry and the rain season, what you see? A huge production of bioavailable form during the dry season, not during the wet season. Because during the dry season, you have a large residence time. So you can react mercury, in this case it's mercury, but also occur for copper, lead, zinc, Then, if you make a balance between uh, river to estuary, estuary to sea, exportation of particulate mercury, which is this uh, brown thing, only occurs when you have very strong rainfall. And then you can break the ocean barrier and export this material to the continental shelf. During the dry season, and even during the wet season, but with low uh, rainfall, you export basically to the S3 reactive dissolved bioavailable mercury. <coughs> so if you put the two models together, the hydrological model and the biochemical model, in the case of mercury, what do you see? During the dry season, you have a small continental flow, a large ocean blocking. Everything inundates the flood playing area, mangroves, increasing re residence time, increasing reactivity, bioavailability of mercury. Therefore, you have bioaccumulation of mercury in the lower estuary and in the continental shelf. Whereas during the high season, you export particulate mercury directly to the continental shelf that ends up in the sediments. <coughs> because of that, 
you have, let's go from here. During the uh, dry and rainy season in the continental shelf, you can see that during the dry season, a strong relationship between mercury and dissolved organic carbon. Whereas during the rainy season, you have no correlation at all. Meaning that during the rainy season, the dissolved organic matter has no uh, influence on the mercury transport or availability. And that during the dry season, all the mercury in the continental shelf, those beautiful golden circles we saw in this slide before, are from the mercury coming from this long-term permanence of the continental water in the, in the estuary. Well, if this is true, then you can, uh, 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 we can see higher concentrations of mercury in the fish inhabiting the lower estuary when you compare with fish inhabiting the higher estuary, even the same species. I don't have the, the slide here. We just finished a large study with the biota. Not only the concentration is much higher using the same species. And uh, interesting, we use little Peneus vaname, which is an exotic species. So it's a very good experience. No one can say, oh, no, this is a, an organism that's naturally there, always accumulate. No, this doesn't do anything. It's run out from the ponds, from the ponds in the lower estuary and in the fluvial. If you analyze the sediments in the fluvial portion, there's lots of mercury there. But this is the particulate mercury that causes no problem. Then you have much more higher concentration in the simps in the lower estuary. And not only that, bioaccumulation rates are 10 times higher. And as a, a result of that, this is a, an estimation of uh, the human exposure in this area to mercury ingested through diet, through eating fish. And you easily see that although most mercury comes from the continent, so I, I, any inorganic compartment like sediments, particles, much more mercury here than here. But in thermobiota, it doesn't respond to the total amount of mercury, but the bioavailable form of mercury. Therefore, the fish here, the shrimp, the crabs, everyone here has much more mercury. And this is already reflecting in the population. So the riverine population living here and eating the fish in here is nearly four times higher exposure than the fluvial population. That eats the same species of fish. I mean, just the, the, the fishermen are different. There are small communities upriver and downriver. Downriver communities are exposed to much more mercury. Well, this is occurring everywhere in the world. So there's not a single legislation in the world that takes care of these aspects. So we don't know what's going to happen. And then I'll try to, 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 to make an example of this, the direct effect of this, uh, I think it's here, no. It's never the same place in the same, in different computers. Mm. Bullshit. I want to, FC. Go ahead. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's no garbage here. They're making an iron for an English. Soil? No, no, no. That is natural mercury. Coming from soil and atmospheric deposition. <coughs> so, uh, what happened when, when we try to make governance over an important ecosystem like mangrove under this scenario? And this is a mess, a complete mess. Uh, in uh, the early 90s, we coordinated a, a huge project from, from the International Society for Mangrove Ecosystem on uh, conservation and sustainable utilization of mangroves in Latin America, Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. And we produced a report with many uh, guidelines for problems, and one of the important things was estimating the anthropogenic drivers that uh, caused problems in mangroves. And this is basically the conclusion of this study. And that, that was a very intensive study because we, we hire scientists in all those major countries having mangroves, 
we paid a grant for them to produce a, a, a report based on primary data instead of just secondary data. Because by that time, we were very scared about, and maybe you already heard that, or at least the Brazilians, Brazil has lost 50% of its total mangrove area. It's written everywhere, but it's not true. And then, knowing that, and then we went to, to look for the, the original source of this information. And we, we never reached it. it. It appears in a paper by Ivan Valiella in 90-something. And uh, we look for the reference of this paper that was known. So I don't know from where he took this number. And this number starts appearing in, in global assessments and everything. And this was true for many other countries, as usual. I mean, normally our countries do not make this kind of assessments. Other people come and do, and depends on what they think. And they were normally wrong. So this, this program was developed mostly for that. We have a very good guy by them in the UNEP, and Salif Diop was there, and also Mark Steyer was in UNESCO, and uh, with ISMI we promoted that, and those guys got the, the primary data. And this is the information. I'm not talking about area. I mean, this in the book I put in the uh, electronic uh, availability for you. But uh, I'm talking about the drivers. And see how these drivers changed a long time and how the law and the agreements, national and international agreement, didn't follow. And therefore, are not applied today. And this, you see, very interesting. One thing that probably people from Asia knows, or everyone knows nowadays, in the 90s, aquaculture, and this is a, this is a hierarchical list. Yeah? So the major driver was urbanization, industrialization, mostly linked to oil. There are lots of oil spills by that time. Dummy agriculture, forestry, tourism, and latest aquaculture. Aquaculture was a problem in Ecuador. Apart from Ecuador, people didn't raise shrimps anywhere. The largest problem was linked to urbanization, industrialization. And these problems were really huge. This is uh, one of the pictures that's in the 80s, whatever in the television, which is the uh, Brazil's largest uh, landfill site in Guanabara Bay, which is the uh, in Rio de Janeiro, about uh, 15,000 tons of, of solid waste, urban solid waste, daily deposited in this area. This is the type of fish you fish there. I mean, don't need even to just to show the fish completely. This is cadmium contamination. Yeah. So this is what you have in the ages. Obviously, as Adam talked to you yesterday, when you see something like that, even the, the least worried people about the environment will immediately get at least uncomfortable. And then a lot of legislation came. And one of the most important was <coughs> trying to like in Guyana, using mangroves, in, including the seafront, like in Fortaleza, where mangroves were included in the, in the city facilities, like in Rodrigo de Freitas Lagoon, where we planted uh, these mangroves. My father used to live here, and we see the guy planting this every day. And then later, they, they asked us to, to cut the tree because people could not see the lagoon. So they, if you go there today, they look like a green uh, fence. I mean, they are all covered. But it doesn't matter, I mean, because uh, the same thing. And the crabs are there, the birds came back, the fish came back. So you can see the results easily. So this was the response. Coastal zone management plans that have been compulsory in Brazil, any other countries in Latin America integrating mangroves in green architecture. Industrialization, again, there was a, a very good example. I'll go back to that other slide. This is the amount of oil accidents between 97 and 99, and this is 2000, 2006. It's a very good review paper by Duke, Norman Duke, who is a great Australian specialist in mangroves. And he reviewed it, and you see clearly the sharp decrease of problems with oil spills. I mean, you have the deep horizon problem, which is unexpected, but the normal thing is that no one more clean uh, tanks inside base, for instance. Whenever you have an accident, people immediately have measurements for that, and the impact on this on mangrove decreased a lot. And this is a very fast response. 
uh, of, of this problem in the case of industrialization in mangrove. Stronger regulation for, like the Brazilian regulation, it, it's so crazy, the Brazilian regulation, that for certain elements, the limit is so close to the natural limit that anyone can pollute the environment. So stringent is this legislation. And this is a result of accidents and things like that. Uh, this is the same uh, landfill site I showed before. And we start recuperating it in 2000 and some, uh, no, 1998, I think. And this is how it looked like today. What we did, uh, well, first stop putting rubbish there. And then after that, recuperating and replanting the mangrove forest around the landfill. And the result is fantastic, except that it's cosmetics. The problem is still there. You see, this is the distribution of mercury, but it's also valid for zinc, for copper, for anything. In uh, the white cycles, uh, mangrove cores, and the black ones are uh, degraded areas without mangroves. And you can really see that metals keep you on migrating to surface waters when you don't have mangroves. And this was contaminating the Guanabara Bay, and it's why the fish was so damaged. And then by putting mangroves, what we did, we just kept the metals in the rhizosphere. So we blocked the transfer to the bay. But look, the concentrations are much higher in the planted forest than before, because there's no longer leaking. So it's accumulating. Perfect. Mangroves don't care about that. It doesn't absorb metals. It nearly doesn't absorb salt. So they are very efficient in blocking the uptake of, of trace metals. So it doesn't matter if you have 1,000 ppm of mercury. If you measure the, the, the leaf, there's no mercury. No problem. But, but it's still there. Yeah? As far as you keep the mangroves intact, there's no problem. But if you cut it, maybe in f some later years, like they did in Rodrigo de Freitas, they need to dredge this for making another canal or whatever, then you can really resuscitate this legacy of pollution. But this is something that we did in response of that environmental situation. And this, you know, was for all agriculture, forestry, tourism, everything. Ecotourism is, is something quite new also. Dumbing. Dumbing is a problem. As I said, in many countries in Europe, in, in North America, and even in Brazil, in humid areas, people are not only thinking, but actually destroying dams. Back the river. But if you go to the semi-arid area that I show you in the, the first part of the talk, you cannot do that. I cannot explode the dams in CRI stage because no one will have fresh water to leave. So some solutions are no solution. So here there's no way of decreasing the impact of this driver. Salt production, well, it's something that is disappearing because of the economy. So no one is going ever to cut mangroves to produce salt. So you don't need any, any, any measure, any legal measure. The market solved the problem. You have to, to produce salt where you can produce salt uh, with some kind of lucre. Uh, otherwise, you cannot. So that's not a problem. But agriculture, yes, it's still a problem more because of siltation and eutrophication, as we saw before. <coughs> and aquaculture. By that time, this is Brazil, uh, so it's a, it's a present day picture. That time, there, there's nothing like that. Brazil didn't produce shrimp in uh, 1998, except for, for fishing, but not from aquaculture. But nowadays, yes. And that curve there shows the, the, the increase we're going to show country by country and how we try to deal with that. <coughs> so, <coughs> how these drivers evolved during this time and how the societal response effectiveness decreased because of that. So I see urbanization. It was basically today a trend of increasing. Yeah? But then the effectiveness of the response was very nice. Most of the countries they do have a planning. They no longer well, 
when you have economic crisis, it's a little bit different. But if you don't have an economic crisis, you no longer leave people building houses by mangroves or cutting mangroves to build houses and things like that. So it was very effective, the planning of urban areas in terms of, of this new development. Deforestation nearly stopped due to this diver. Hmm? Industrialization decreasing throughout, meaning that the response was very effective because industrialization is a point source of pollutants, very easy to control. So it was very effective. Dumbing, well, problem, because in semi-arid coast you cannot explode the dams. So it's very difficult to cope with dams. There are very few, very small experience in the world where people could not solve, but at least decrease the impact of dams by building extra canals, by diverting other rivers and things like that. But it's not easy. If you really need the water, there's no way except having dams. So increasing semi-arid coast, mostly because global change is decreasing rainfall. Agriculture, eutrophication is increasing because by that time, most of the agriculture along the coast was uh, small-scale agriculture. Nowadays, the large-scale agriculture that was typical from inland, soya bean, sugar cane, is approaching the coast. In the northeast, uh, in Paraíba and Pernambuco state, there are some sugar cane plantation that actually finishes in a mangrove. You have a sugar cane plant one side, the other side is a Avicenia plant. So they are moving into, uh, and this kind of agriculture is the one that produces eutroph eutrophication because you have excess nutrients from <coughs> uh, fertilization. Forest is not a problem. It was a problem up to the 80s, uh, 80s, not the 80s, 1880s in Brazil. Because when the, the, the Portuguese crown moved, the uh, ledger producers in, uh, in Brazil pressed the kingdom to, to promote a law for protecting mangroves. That's the first environmental law in Brazil, dated uh, 1806. And that was just a uh, you know, lobby from the, the, the ledger people because they used the bark to, to, to prepare the ledger. So forest uh, people, well, maybe if you go in Sao Paulo, Rio, there was some cutting, but if you go to the large forests in the north, which are the mangroves, really, here yeah, it's just shrubs, the mangroves there, there they don't cut it. So forest is not a problem, not a problem throughout Latin America. In fact, only in Venezuela there was a historically an economic e exploitation of timber at the Orinoco Delta based on mangroves. But it lasts from uh, 1925 to 42 or something like that. So. Very few people eventually use mangrove timber in Latin America and the Caribbean. Fisheries, again, uh, the impact is decreasing because fisheries is decreasing. So, and it, it will probably decrease even faster. South production, the economic crisis finished that. But aquaculture starts increasing very fast in the end of last century uh, to now. <coughs> Then comes the paradox. If the societal response was so effective in decreasing point source of contamination, in protecting mangroves, uh, plans of coastal management, zoning plans all over the regions, in Brazil, structured reserves. Now, there are beautiful things that people do, community-based, uh, sustainable use and things like that. Lots of terms that I heard here today. So why we start in the second, in the 21st second with this situation, where a lot of mangroves area are still threatened. Now some of the species are not only threatened but are vulnerable. I mean, uh, calling a mangrove species vulnerable is like, you know, calling Mike Tyson weak. I mean, to make a mangrove tree vulnerable, you really have to impact it. Otherwise, you can't. I mean, you probably know about mangroves. You try to, to, to 
have a boat close to a mangrove. I mean, your marina will finish soon. But today you have some areas in, in Latin America and the Caribbean that they do are vulnerable. So the societal response, although beautiful and technically very good, didn't work. Why didn't work? You see the case of Brazil. I mean, you can, you can uh, consult this paper. And, and I think I sent them to you. Most of mangroves in Brazil are protected by law uh, since 1926, the first forest code. Except that to the new forest code, the forest code considered mangroves anything, the trees, the salt ponds, the salt flats, the so-called apicums, as mangroves. So no one was allowed to build anything there. So this is the yellow thing. It protected everything. All mangroves in Brazil are protected by the forest code. So no one can catch. If you, if you cut a mangrove tree, you can go to jail. Except if you have money to pay someone, then you don't go. But if you don't have, you go. But then the new forest coach simply said, well, you know, these salt plants and apicons, they, they are not really mangrove. This is a forest coach, so we are protecting the trees in the forest coach. And the municipalities, depending on their plants, protect or not the backside, the Farms and things like that. Well, this law didn't consider global change as a viable, because if they did, they would know that this area is the area that mangroves can migrate into, into large. None of the environmental legislation in Brazil or in Latin America, and maybe probably in Africa, you can tell me, or in Asia, you can tell me, take climate change into consideration. I, I know no legislation. Legislation. There are many agreements that people talk, and then Mr. Trump's go out, go in, but legislation, known, take into consideration climate change. They think it's a future thing. But as we saw, it's not a future thing. So what happened? What are the bottlenecks of this large societal response towards mangroves? First, lacking of inclusion of an already real and present climate change scenario. That's the first thing. And this is not only global change. It's, it's not accepting that the coastal zone is a dynamic thing. So every law regarding the coastal zone should be reevaluated permanently. So New Forest Code in Brazil is an example. Community-based management. That's fantastic. When you still have an economy based on family agriculture, subsistence agriculture. But when you start having large capital investments, when the large agriculture business comes to the coast, when stream farming, which is contrary to many countries, is not done by families, it's done by huge entrepreneurs, by huge capital, community-based management doesn't work. They cannot cope with capital. No way. And there are many examples. Brazil was one of the first countries to, to create uh, structured reserves, for instance. And it's very difficult to keep them. There was a paper by Marion Glaser that came out maybe this week about the experience in Brazil, 26 years of experience of community-based management. It's not easy. It works pretty well. Yes, where? In Pará, Maranhão, the large mangrove forest, where there's no capital investment there. Because you cannot build shrimp culture there, you cannot make agriculture there. We are talking about a 45 to 80 kilometers inland of mangrove fringe. So impossible. You even, even have access to there. But if you come to the southeast or to the northeast, then community based management has to face the large capital, and they can't. Yeah? So this strategy, although very, very good, is very limited. Harbor development is another example. You have an example in Rio, the Asu Harbor, which is a disaster very recently, where you have a coastal area. There are a few mangroves, but mostly sand dunes, that has a community-based management structure that was be being destroyed by the harbor cup. <coughs> the structured reserves, I don't know, uh, maybe it's not the same thing in Africa or in, in Asia, but at least in Latin America and Brazil, most authorities think that the queen an instructive reserve is enough. So this area now is for environmental friendly 
structure in, for local population. So they, they forget that they are local population, that they are humans, that they need support, that you have to plan for some economic strategies to make it profitable. So most of them didn't work because they don't make enough money to maintain the structure bin. And then when they face capital, they forget about their reserves with very few exceptions. Uh, there is an example in, in, in Ceará State, which is the production of honey in, in mangrove areas. Fantastic, a beautiful thing, but the government never gave any kind of subsidy. So they cannot sell in the supermarket. So either you are, I, I love nature, so I go there and buy their honey, or they don't sell their honey. So no way. It's, it's not just a, a romantic thing. If you don't give the, the basic, there's no way. Increasing water demand, and, and another thing that was uh, expected, but not in that speed, which is the concentration of everything along the coast in Latin America and the Caribbean. I mean, when we did this survey in the 90s, we have maybe 50% of the Brazilian population living by the coast. So today we have 72 or 78, something like that. So, <coughs> so what is the problem today in Latin America? First thing. Aquaculture. Aquaculture, if you remember, it was in the base of the table. Now it's the top. Not only is it in the top, but this, this activity, as I showed before, and I think I have a graph somewhere uh, here. Sorry for skipping, but then I'm trying to, to go a little bit faster. I'll go back there, anyhow. This is the evolution of stream production through aquaculture in Latin America and the Caribbean. And you see, the speed of this activity, there's not, even the time you take to discuss the law in the, in the Senate or in the Congress is much longer than you can double the activity. So you see, Brazil, for instance, Brazil is the, the triangle here. When we finished that study in 94, there was nothing. No one, there was one, maybe the universities think about uh, growing streams. I remember when I studied marine biology, people talk about, well, oh, let's make shrimp aquaculture. In 1904, there was not a shrimp from shrimp ponds in Brazil. And it kept like that till maybe 2000, 2002. From 2002 and 2004, it became the largest production in Latin America. And maybe God didn't like it and sent a virus and <laughs> production decreased. And then came an economic crisis and, and it's not growing. But the potential for growing is immense. Much faster than any legislation can cope with the activity. So, a very strong problem. <coughs> Damming, as I said, there's nothing to do. Because you have to, to keep on damming the rivers, otherwise you don't have the water. So what you have to do is try to, 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 to include this variable when you plan the coastal zone. So when you have a basin committee or a coastal zone committee, they have to take in consideration what they are doing upriver. And normally they don't do it. So it's a problem. Climate change, again, is a major issue. It's not only sea level rise, but acidity. And again, it's something very fast. I remember when I started uh, teaching uh, climate change in my courses in the graduate program, uh, maybe 2002 or 2003, CO2 level in the atmosphere was around 385. Nowadays, it's 416. So, and, and, and from there to today, no one even agree what we're going to do. I mean, uh, the Americans just left the Paris Agreement. The Kyoto had to be renewed because no, 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 no goal was achieved. And in this period, we increase CO2 in the atmosphere of about 10%. So it's, again, a very fast process. Well, one good thing is because of that, there was a huge effort of replanting mangroves in the graded area. And today is a very important driver of changes in the area, for the good, most of the time. Uh, in Asia, for instance, in, in Indonesia, we have a large project there replanting over 300,000 hectares of mangrove. And mostly after the tsunami, because uh, if you look at pictures, you see the 
areas that have a fringe of mangrove has much less destruction than have areas that haven't. So uh, this is a very positive thing that happened during this period. I mean, we didn't replant mangroves in the 90s. Urbanization is an intermediate and stable, depends a lot on economic crisis and improvement of the population. And then we go back, like Brazil is doing, 20 years in two, and we're going back. And then again, it may become a problem again. And agriculture, this migration of highly industrialized uh, agriculture to the coast is a problem. So, notwithstanding all this problem related in the world literature, this is, uh, I selected uh, non-scientific journals throughout the world. The Guardian, this is the importance of mangrove to people, call to action. And this is the matrix that this United Nations 2014 document arrived. Yeah? This is the major conclusion. conclusion. So, what they talk about aquaculture? Well, they agree with our study. It's high and increasing. Dummy, they didn't even mention in the whole assessment that dummy may be a significant driver to mangroves. <coughs> Climate change, oh, the obvious solution. We don't know yet. We have to discuss more. So they don't list as a driver of impact to mangroves. Replanting rehabilitation, they don't even mention that. Although in certain country, countries, replanted forests is up to 25% of the total mangrove area, and they didn't mention that. And this is not an assessment done by a small, obscure university in London, Brazil. This is done by United Nations. Urbanization, medium increasing including tourism. Agriculture, even mention agriculture. They still think agriculture is something from inland problem and doesn't go to the coast and doesn't affect the rivers that goes into the coast. So they don't mention agriculture as a significant driver uh, to mangroves, conservation. And industrialization, they still think it's an important thing, mostly because of pollution. Yeah? Salt production, they don't mention and it's not important. Fishery, they don't mention. It's not important also. Forest, major and too stable, depending on the countries. Tourism, they don't mention tourism at all. Although certain countries in the Caribbean have a very large revenue from tourism in mangroves. So, when you have this assessment, which is supposed to be a global picture of what's going on in mangroves, then something is wrong. I mean, uh, they have to, to rethink. And, and, and he think seriously, because if you do any policy based on this assessment, obviously it won't change the real necessities. And one thing they never mention, again, in no agreement, no legislation. Uh, this is something that we derived from some papers in the, in the late 90s that uh, we, we were very worried about pollution by soil pollution. And uh, <coughs> we disco uh, discovered this capacity, which is for the ecology is very well known, but then we adapted that for pollution. Uh, the, the, the bold dark line is uh, the evolution of the absorption capacity of an ecosystem, any ecosystem, to uh, pollutants. So it means that if you have an increasing load when the ecosystem is really uh, largely pristine. This results in a very small release of pollutants to incorporation the biota, mobility in waters and things like that. Meaning that pristine ecosystems can accumulate a lot of pollutants without releasing it. But as the ecosystem starts reaching its maximum capacity, then the, the same amount of increasing load that you see in key 2 over there results in an enormous leaking of the pollutants. The, the good analogy is a new sponge that you buy to, to clean your dishes at home and you put it to under, the, uh, under the water 
and the water doesn't pass through. It starts wetting the sponge to which reach the maximum capacity. Then psh, everything that comes in goes out. With the ecosystems, it's the same thing. And the more degraded the ecosystem, these curves, meaning that small amount of changes in a very degraded ecosystem can cause an enormous effect on pollutant release. Well, it's very, very, if not impossible, to find a natural ecosystem in, in the world today. And we are still planning our environmental laws based on pristine ecosystem, on this line over there. And this is a very good example. Again, mangroves, but not, me not metals, but phosphorus. This is uh, two different areas. One that has 2,000 pounds of uh, shrimp farming, the other one has nine. The total amount of phosphorus emitted by this pond is nearly 70 tons per year. And there, 100 kilograms per year. <coughs> when you make a balance, what is coming in and going out, you see that in this pristine forest, or more pristine forest, up to 96% of all the phosphorus that goes into the mangroves stay there. It's transforming primary productivity of the mangroves. Yeah? In fact, most of the mangroves are limited by nutrients. If you put phosphorus there, it will grow like hell. But that, there is a limit for that, as you see in, in the graph. I mean, in that uh, left side mangrove, you are here. So you put 100 kilograms of phosphate. Only 4% goes out, like you see here. And the other one is already close to its maximum support capacity. It's receiving phosphorus at very high quantities for quite a long time. Then the leaking is much higher. So this can only keep less than 45% of the phosphorus coming into the, the system. And this is probably happening everywhere. Whenever an ecosystem is losing or is going out of its natural reference value, whenever it is biological, biogeochemical, geological, it loses the capacity of absorbing any stress. This is not only true for, for pollutants. It's true for any kind of stress. And our laws are all based on natural ecosystems, which is an, a, a, a reality. <laughs> we don't have it any longer. A uh, very sad example is, is fire in the Amazon. Even decreasing the new fire, every year the fires increase because it, it's attacking areas that had been burned before, that has lost the lower vegetation, and then now it's, baking, uh, it's burning the trees. And we are unable to, 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 to think about that when you talk about governance, and there's a problem. Well, I'm not going to go through, except this. This is a very nice slide. It's a very, uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, this book is already in the, the bibliography I, I sent to you. It's a recent chapter we published uh, last year in spring. It's a, uh, with many colleagues. And we make a, we made a, an estimate on what would happen if we cut all mangroves in the globe. Today, A and B, mangroves accumulate a sink of CO2, a large sink of CO2. Yeah? <coughs> and CAG are different scenarios. Yeah? And this is the present anthropogenic carbon emission. Yeah? This is a scenario of mangrove deforestation. So if you cut the mangroves, you will be putting into the atmosphere the same amount that all fossil fuel, fuel burning and forest burning in the tropics or whatever any other anthropogenic source of carbon is emitting to the atmosphere. So it's why mangroves are so important that you take care about. Because the potential impact in global warming is gigantic. But global warming, again, is not viewed as a significant driver for mangrove sustainable utilization and conservation. So, It's an important aspect that, to my view, should be taken into consideration whenever we think about governance in coastal areas in the tropics. 
basically, how to deal with those uh, impacts of driving that change drastically in very short periods of time, like shrimp culture. What you deal with it. Uh, rehabilitation strategy and conservation. Is the present legislation able to cope with the present situation? Climate change is one, but it's not only climate change. Where I work, people are planning to build new dams because population is growing and the rainfall is decreasing. So, damming. How does global climate change interact site specifically with local drivers? And this is another thing. I mean, the, the Arctic paradox is one thing. If I have first major conference about um, how the increasing the pollution of the Arctic Sea because of uh, global warming, all the environmentalists in the area from CRI State, for instance, say, oh, thanks God, because here we're losing water, then there will be less contamination in the ocean. But due to a specific situation of mangroves growing in semi-arid areas, just occur the same thing in the actual. We export a lot of bioavailable pollutants to the ocean, and we are contaminating a pristine area. One thing that never, is never, again, it's very seldom included in literature, which is the, the typology. The first slide we showed, one of the first slides that we show talking about uh, exporters and importers of material at the, the, the interface, the, the law is the same. The law is always the same for the rich, for the poor, but the result is completely different from the rich and the poor. So it's the same thing. The law is the same for exportation nursery or an importation bay. It's the same law, but we are talking about different typologies. So it may or may not be applicable. And finally, <coughs> how this impact will act with global change, in a global change scenario, because nowadays, I think, at least if you are a quite realistic person, global change is no longer a variable. It's, a, it's an independent variable. It's, it's like gravity. It is occurring, and we will carry on occurring, because no one is taking care of stopping it. So you have to start thinking, stop thinking about dreaming about stopping global warming, and thinking how global warming will impact the local drivers and start thinking about organizing local drivers, take into consideration its feedback with global warming. And there is unfortunately it's not done also. So I think uh, this, this is it. Now up to you to make questions, comments. Don't throw anything because sometimes you run. And, uh... Hi, Adrian from Mexico. Well, I've been hearing about mangroves' importance since I started my career as a biologist. And now in my master's, I moved to Yucatan, that it's like a, where we have like even more mangroves. Mm -hmm. And one of the main problems is that Yes, we're trying to do legislation to, to protect the mangroves, but we have the tourist business getting in from other countries as USA, Europe. They even got fire into the mangroves forest. We suppose we did a legislation mm -hmm. where you can build into a, man, uh, a born forest, and maybe you can construct anything there, um, after like 10 years. Mm -hmm. But this is not happening in any place of Mexico. So there's a lot of people, NGOs, scientific communities, a lot of people trying to do something for helping, but it seems that economic issues are even more important than these kinds of things. I mean, all the ecological services, the CO2 that they keep. So how can we do, how, how can we do to, for trying to do a change with that? Because in, it's concerning, because it's not only affecting that area, also the coral reefs we have, mm. the pollution, and it's not even our country. It's other countries that come for investment, and I think it's just not fair. 
How can we help with that? Because yeah, we're see, trying to talk. The, the Mexican, they have a very good experience in this area, in the, the Maya Riviera, which is a very, very nice and modern legislation protecting mangroves, including green architecture, including mangroves in the developing of the, 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 the tourist in, uh, industry. So in my view, it's a problem of enforcing. And then it's, it's, it's like we have the community-based uh, conservation structures in Brazil. I mean, it's a very good idea. It works pretty well, but you have to enforce it. And to enforce it, in case of community-based strategies, you have to get some kind of government support to them. Maybe what you need to do there is actually public awareness of the legislation uh, that created, for instance, the green architecture in the Maya Riviera. That's a very good example. In fact, I used this example in a, in a paper we wrote. Yes. But then there's a problem of enforcing it. And obviously, you're talking about capital, high capital. Yeah, tourism, international tourism, hotels, large hotels, and whatever. And then some of these uh, legislations, yeah. if they are not supported by, by a stronger government uh, subsidy, they, they are very difficult to face the large capital. We, we've been having supporting like from legislation, but it's no, exactly. it's not so, happening. Yeah, yeah, it's not know, happening because the economic interest. Yeah. I mean, no, no, it's a problem. It's a problem in Latin America. I mean, uh, to face mm -hmm. the large capital is very difficult. We have the law, but we cannot enforce the law because they are stronger. Yeah. That's a problem. Thank you. But Mexico is doing some good experience on the on the Pacific side oh. on. Mangroves uh, using, uh, yeah, because of enforcing, again. But the initiative is very nice. Um, they are even closing uh, like the newspaper, and this is like a huge scandal in Sinaloa. Mm -hmm. Because government kind of sell a natural protected area to build like a gas station, and then when the newspaper made all the research, the investigation about what they did, what government did was to close the newspaper offices because they own taxes to Hacienda. I don't know how you call it. In. So they're even shutting up the medium. So what can we do? It was a huge research. It was a huge area, but government. Some politic boy by the, I don't know how to say it. They buy this land that was in natural protected area, like some people live there, and they buy them like the, the area, mm -hmm. and they sell it again to the government yeah. in a huge ridiculous money, and they, they start to build the gas station and take all the mangrove away. And when the newspaper wanted to say what they did, they closed the same day the newspaper office for nobody can get the news. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's government even in, no, in that yeah. issue. So I think it's frustrating. Yeah, and it's but this sad. is not a problem of uh, scientists. Yeah. It's uh, scientists as citizens. We have to, to change things in Latin America. Our continent still have this crazy problem. So it yeah. doesn't matter if you have a good legislation. I mean, it doesn't breakage. matter we have good legislation, we have corruption. Yeah. <laughs> Luis from Brazil. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, from three pounds, they, when they take out the shrimps, they re release the sediment normally in nearby mangroves. Um, how it can impact the carbon stock and greenhouse gas emissions in these areas by chronic impact? No, yeah, there, there is a, a very nice study recently done by a group from Sao Paulo and Rio Grande do Norte on the, the carbon balance between mangrove and shrimp farming. Yeah? And the amount of carbon that you, because you destroy mangroves, uh, if, you, if you do destroy mangrove, then it's a problem. But even if you don't, uh, we, we I mean, you can see it in the YouTube. I showed the, to the people yesterday, there is a video called Mission, Missão Parnaíba. Yeah, it's a, an expedition we did uh, some months ago to, to measure CO2 fugacity in this 
area. The, the Parnaíba Delta is the largest mangrove area in, in the Americas, uh, single mangrove delta. And uh, you can see, easily see the amount of CO2 emissions from the natural mangrove. And then when you fuel it with carbon from the stream culture, which is easily degradable, then you increase it a lot. So carbon emission is enormous. Even if you don't cut the mangroves, just from the effluents. Because the effluents is basically stream pegdises, stream feces, and rest of uh, aquafeeds. And the carbon there is immediately uh, oxid oxidable and release CO2 in very large amounts. And, and the other, some years ago, I don't know if you know him, Alexandre Weinberg, that was killed by an employer. And he was the spearhead of a called organic aquaculture yeah, in please. Rio Grande do Norte. Yeah. So do you really think that it's more in friendly for the environment and can be applied in large scales? Yeah, uh, you see, it, it's a kind of, uh, 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 he's a very bright guy. He, because he aggregates, obviously, if you do organic shrimp culture, like he does, the production is much less. So he first looked for a market that would like to buy his shrimp. Because uh, whereas a normal large shrimp culture produces uh, 16 gram shrimps and, and export it raw, basically, what he does uh, without hedging and also produce uh, another effluent, which is important, he produces larger shrimps that goes to 130 grams, very expensive, and sold to specific markets that use this, uh, top restaurants and things like that. So the lucrativity, yes, they, very good. And since you have more profit, you don't need to, to have larger areas. By using this, in fact, what he does is inducing primary productivity to feed the shrimp instead of using aqua feed. He does use aqua feed, but not in the large amounts that people normally use, mostly in the, the first stages. After that, no, it's natural. Obviously, the, the growth rate is very small, but then he has a, a specific market for this shrimp. So in the end, he has very large profits. And most important, in the long range, the virus that attacks the, 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 the commercial shrimp farm didn't reach his farm because the density of his farm is very low. Then, yes, it's possible. It's possible and profitable. It's a very good experience. Thank you. Hi, um, here. I am Paulina from Mexico, and it's um, a like. It's almost the same question that already asked you, Luis, but look in other way. I have, I will, I'm interested on to know your opinion about the aquaculture as an option to decrease overfishing at the oceans, and particularly, particularly because in Mexico, um, I'm from where are the Marismas Nacionales, the national wetlands, the biggest wetlands in our country. So are being very affected because this issue, you know, in the west coast of Mexico, in the Pacific, is um, the area is being very affected by uh, shrimp farms and aquaculture and very affected. You know. Well, you see, uh, fisheries. Fisheries is something that we do maybe since we left the caves and there was some water and didn't change very much. It changed the quality of the net, the size of the net. And uh, the truth is, uh, for the past maybe 10 or 15 years, uh, the amount of fisheries is the same and even decreasing a little bit. And there is, a, a, a obviously, a support capacity for producing fisheries. And it's not too much than what we already produce. So I, I can't see that we're going to double the fisheries without any very strong effect on the natural stocks. So aquaculture is a solution. There's no, I, I have no doubt about that. But then, what you do with stream farming, you're trying to make, it's quite crazy, because shrimps, I mean, uh, 
Maybe the first time you date your boyfriend, he took you to a nice restaurant to eat shrimps. Yeah? Because shrimps is something special. Yeah? And then you try to make a special food in, a, in, a, in a solving the, the, the problem of hunger in the world. And this is, doesn't work. Yeah? Uh, we have a very good experience of aquaculture in Sierra State, which is tilapia. Tilapia, there's no problem of eating because it eats soya bean, basically. So it's plant protein. It's cheap, and then you can feed a lot of people with this. You have a much higher production because we're talking about one kilogram fish that is ready for consumption in four months or something in cages. There are problems of, uh, of uh, water quality. Yes, we have very bad experience because we start growing tilapia in fish cages in a reservoir that has 100 million liters of water and two years later it has 10 because there's no rain. And then all the water is a trophy cage. But you can create tilapia in a, in a closed system like you can do with shrimps. But you're never going to feed people with shrimps. Shrimps has to be for the first date dinner. Yeah? And it has a lot of cholesterol. If, if everyone starts eating too much, they will probably have a problem. So what we have to, to do in aquaculture is one thing that Pauli has said for fisheries some many years before, which is fishing at the lower food chain. So we have to produce good quality protein based on sheep, cheap and, 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 and plant protein. And there are many fishes that you can do this. Tilapia is one of them. You have to take care. I mean, uh, you know, many African rivers where most of the sea leads uh, has the highest diversity are losing native species because of uh, aquaculture tilapia. So you have to take care. But I'm assuming you're going to take care. And if you do take care, I think there's a much better uh, opportunity to feed people, to substitute fisheries than shrimp. Shrimp is like this, this colleague of Rins. He's a very uh, rich entrepreneur now, produce very small amounts of shrimp for the first date dinner of Europeans that eat large fish. Fantastic. But try to make it like they do in Northeast Brazil. That is stupid. I mean, you're exporting one kilogram of shrimp uh, by two or three dollars. Uh, you know, it's, it's impossible because in any market it will cost much more. So shrimp farming, yes, it can exist and I c it can be done in, in a closed system without many, many impacts to the environment, but not in this, uh, in this extension that they are thinking about. So aquaculture will, I think it will substitute part of the fisheries because the fisheries is, is becoming more and more a rich people meal. Uh, when I moved to Ceará, I started eating fishing a lot, but when I live in Rio and maybe in Sao Paulo, it's the same thing. Fish is something that you eat in the first date also. It's becoming too expensive. So it, I think it will substitute. But we have to, to, to really make clear what we want. If it's shrimp, then do organic shrimp. I mean, beautiful large shrimps in small amounts, done it in an environmental friendly environment. But producing shrimp in large scale, like they are planning to do here, or like they have done in Ecuador and in Mexico, then it's a risk, it's unacceptable. But there are other, other, other opportunities. I, I mean, I'm talking as a biogeochemist. I'm not talking as a conservationist or anything like that. I really love to eat shrimps and fish, not tilapia, but fish in general. But uh, I think it's possible. And we have to do that because it's such a risk has a limit, as, as the, 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 the statistic, the fish of his statistics is showing. I mean, and there's, you're not going to, to expand that, except if you destroy the stocks, like we did in the past. The cod in Canada, there are many examples. And then uh, you have to, to produce protein, yes. But there are other ways. Tilapia, I think, is a very good way. Except that you have to take care. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you find tilapia mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, if you go swimming in a, in, a, in a lagoon in the dunes in Ceará, there are a lot of tilapia there. Maybe if you flush your toilet, there is a tilapia there. 
I mean, they, but that's because people didn't take care about this. So if you do it right, uh, but the problem is if, if you do shrimp aquaculture right to produce the same amount as you do with tilapia, there's no way of avoiding environmental impact. So I think, yes, aquaculture, yes, is a solution. But you have to think more seriously about that. Uh, hi. I'm sorry if you have more questions, but it's already time for us to move into the poster section. So if you have any more questions for the Professor Luis Drudso, then you can do uh, along the breaks or along next day. Thank you.